This is your life, a program for all America. And now here he is, Mr. This is your life himself, Ralph Edwards. Thank you. Thank you very much for being with us on This is Your Life. Tonight, let's turn the lights on over there by the double door and watch carefully to see what happens. Our honored guest, whom we're about to surprise tonight, is known to all of you as one of the truly great and beloved stars of the theater, motion pictures, radio, and television. Pan the camera quickly, please. He's not coming through those doors because he's seated right there innocently watching our producer's monitor. Tonight, this is your life, Boris Karloff. I do mean it. All right, pal. Come here. <laughs> Boris, I think we really put the... Oh, my. <laughs> <laughs> this, uh, believe me, is the greatest shocker, I think, of all time. He's, uh, he has been giving shocks all his life tonight. Boris, uh, it wasn't as easy as it might seem. You us. both be, I think. <laughs> what could be more natural than to have your good friends, Jane and Mill Stone, invite you and your lovely wife, Evie, to dinner and to include Barbara and Ralph Edwards in the invitation? And why not see Ralph's show first and then go on uh, from there? We've done it many times before, I think about three or four times in the last couple of months, right, Boris? And how many years have I been trusting you? <laughs> Obvious ruse is often the best. Seriously, Boris, we've been looking forward to this night for a long, long time. I'm sure our audience is in for as many surprises as you are. I hope not. When they learn that the Frankenstein monster, the bogeyman of the screen, is actually one of the kindest, most warm-hearted men among us into whose arms little children run almost instinctively, well... This is the story we're going to tell tonight. So come along, Boris Karloff, to our stage and to our chair of honor. Uh, Evie, we'll see you later. Axe, will you take... Uh, <laughs> he's falling out, Evie. Take Axe. Well, Boris... <laughs> oh, my, we're doing about a, a world of explanation here in about 30 seconds. You've played hundreds of parts on the stage and pictures on radio and television, but your role here tonight is completely new, isn't it? It is indeed. <laughs> I'm sure you'll enjoy it, so sit back and relax. What did you say? <laughs> <laughs> this is your life, Boris Karloff. <laughs> Boris Karloff, that's a Slavic name, but you're uh, not Russian, are you? Uh, no, not Boris? really. Uh, you were born in... I was born in Dulwich, England. When did you take the name uh, of Boris Karloff? Well, when I first went on the stage, 1910, actually, up in Western Canada. Uh, why did you change your name, Boris? Well, it was a family name on my mother's side, and uh, I thought my own name of Pratt, if I ever got uh, known in the theater, might be unfortunate. What was your real name before that? Pratt. George... Uh, William Henry William Pratt. Henry Pratt. The youngest of nine children, your father dies when you're just a baby, Boris, so you're brought up by your mother and your older brothers and your sister. As a boy, you attend school at Uppingham. I'm afraid the young Bill Pratt was not a very distinguished scholar at Uppingham. Now, I'll bet you haven't the slightest <laughs> notion who that is, Boris. You so many people could have said that. <laughs> <laughs> this gentleman in 1907, 50 years ago. We have brought him here tonight from Edgbaston, Birmingham, England. Your schoolmate of 50 years ago at Uppingham. Here Jeff is Taylor. Jeffrey Taylor. <laughs> Jeff Taylor. <laughs> Jeffrey, he remembers and that's fantastic. Oh, I've got to say a word. Now, look here, Bill. I've brought yes. you a little memento. The old oh, school. Oh, the tie. Okay. <laughs> now, you say Boris, or Bill, as you call him, uh, wasn't much of a student. I can't believe that, Mr. Taylor. Well, not as you'd notice it. <laughs> no. <laughs> Why, even then, Bill, your first love was cricket, wasn't it? Yes. And you yes. played for the House Eleven? Yeah, well, after a fashion. Yes, and, r and for Rugger as well. Yes, after a fashion, too. <laughs> Now, do you remember... You were on the running eight. I was. You I were. was. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Well, now, do you remember how we used to walk down the hill to early morning school? Indeed, I do. And how we all ran the last bit. <laughs> Always late, <laughs> yes. and the door being yes, closed yes. in our faces. <laughs> 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 oh, uh, do you remember the Leicester Mile? Yes. Yes, yes. indeed. Yes, and, and that uh, 
That uh, to... And the cross-country runs, it used to wind up there. Yes, always. Yes. And you remember that shop in the high street by mm -hmm. Weldon's, where we used to get the... Uh, uh, Baldwin. Was it Baldwin? No, no, the Baldwin's was the... Um, that was the, the sports shop. The sport shop. Yes. <laughs> I may have to step in here any moment. <laughs> where, where we used to get those, um, you know, fruit, uh, salad. Mean, fruit salad. salad. Yes, yes. With, the, with the cream and the yes. bananas yes. and everything. Yes. Yes. Boys, yes. I can see you two fellas could go on for hours reliving your school days. I promise you, you can carry on at the party in uh, your honor, Boris, right after the show at the Hollywood Roosevelt Hotel where Mr. Taylor, all your friends have been staying. Thank you, Mr. Jeffrey Taylor of Birmingham, England, for being with us tonight. At your family's insistence, you enroll at King's College in London to prepare for the consular service, but you already had an eye on the theater as a career, so in 1909, your mother having passed away, you leave King's College, Boris, and take ship for the greener pastures of Canada. As an actor, Boris? No, I, uh, I worked as a farmhand to start with. Yes, you work your way westward across Canada to Vancouver, British Columbia. Mm -hmm. While waiting for that first acting job, uh, how did you make a living? Well, I cleared land, uh, shoveled coal, laid streetcar tracks, did all sorts of things. Then you hear that the Gene Russell players in Kamloops are in need of an experienced actor. You apply and are accepted. But uh, you hadn't any professional experience, had you? None Boris? whatsoever. Your only experience was, I think, at 10. What did you do in a play then? Well, uh, that time I was, I used to live in Enfield. And every year at Christmas time, they did a sort of a pantomime for two nights, and uh, I played the Demon King in Cinderella. <laughs> and what, what was the play you made your professional debut in, Boris? Uh, by golly, that was prophetic, too. That was The Devil That's by Franz Bolnar. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're, you're learning your craft as you play with one stock company after another, rattling across the United States and uh, Canada, moving from boarding house to boarding house, and often appearing in two different plays a week. In 1915, you're with the Harry St. Clair Stock Company in Minot, North Dakota. Boris, again appearing in Cinderella. But this time, instead of the demon, you were one of the ugly sisters. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you. Another voice that you won't recognize, or a voice, because you did re recognize uh, Mr. Taylor, uh, though you knew it well 42 years ago when he was chief errand boy and general helper at the Opera House here from Minot, North Dakota, where he's president of his own advertising company, Mr. J. Warren Bacon. Warren Bacon. Now you have a... Boris, I too have a small mem memento of your years in Minot, it's a picture of the old rooming house where you used to oh, live. Oh, yes, 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 yes. It's one of those gables, yes. I wonder, yes, did you? Oh, that. That. <laughs> the next part Boris played was Charlie's aunt, wasn't it, Warren? Yes, he could play any part convincingly. <laughs> <laughs> How did the people of Minot uh, like uh, Boris Karloff? Warren? Well, and in spite of the fact that he played mostly villain roles, uh, they loved Boris. And uh, to give you an idea, George Magnuson used to keep the drugstore fountain open at night so you could go there and have a Coke that, after these. right across the street. Right across the street. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, J. Warren Bacon of Minot, North Dakota. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, it's 1919 now, Boris, and it finds you in San Francisco. The Robert Lawrence Stock Company, of which you're a member, is playing the Majestic uh, Theater there, south of the slot. It was at the old Majestic, Boris, 38 years ago that I shared a dressing room with you. Well, now you haven't seen this fellow actor in 25 years. He's now sales manager of the Culligan Development Company in San Mateo, California. Here is James Edwards. Jim Edwards. Hiya, boys. Good to see you. I'm glad to see you. I'm the only one who stuck to it, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> what have you heard? Boris, the Nasser brothers, the owners of a chain of theaters in the San Francisco area, want you to have these doorknobs. <laughs> They're the same knobs that your <laughs> hand touched every time you went in and out of our dressing room. Well, thank you very much. What do you uh, remember about Boris at the Majestic Theater back in 1919 and 20, Jim? Well, Boris was a very capable character actor, Ralph, mm -hmm. and he was tremendously popular with children. And it was a common sight to see Boris striding down Mission Street, smiling happily, and always followed by an admiring group of 
Six or eight small fry. He was a hard-working actor, wasn't he? Yes, indeed he was, Ralph. I can still see Boris sitting in the dressing room hour after hour, working with grease paint, nose putty, yes. crepe hair, and wigs, trying to perfect the art of changing his appearance. Anything to cover myself up, in other words. <laughs> and Boris, believe me, what you taught yourself in that dressing room certainly paid in your movie days. Thank you very much. Steve. Thank you for being with us. James Edwards of San Mateo, California. Are you going to make bookends out of these? I could brand them, yes. I used to. <laughs> As you used to. Well, wait, we haven't come to that part. You can't tell what we'll have for that there, Boris. How the tools of the art of makeup and your insistence on perfection raised you to sudden and unexpected stardom. In Hollywood, we'll learn in just a moment. This is your life. Boris Carlo. Well, Boris, uh, English schoolboy, Canadian farmer, stock actor. How many years did you spend playing stock, Boris? Oh, 10 or 11 years. Mm -hmm. Magic. A training ground for proficiency. A very good training ground. Very few actors today have had. And here in 1920, Hollywood is just around the corner. This is your life, Boris Carlo. <laughs> How did you make the trip from San Francisco to Los Angeles, Boris? On a lumber schooner. A lumber schooner? It was so heavy a deck load, there was no place to sit. <laughs> you started in pictures as an extra, didn't you? Yes. What was the uh, movie, do you recall? I think it was a Doug Fairbanks picture. His Majesty the American. Yes. But uh, I, played, I played an extra... In a, sort of a revolutionary army. I think I was the 13th from the left in the back row somewhere. <laughs> but jobs for extras and bit players are not too frequent. So what kind of work did you do in between picture jobs? Well, I, I got myself a job in a, in a building material yard uh, with George L. Eastman. Mm -hmm. Eventually, I drove a truck there. Is it? And then one hot or summer... Or as Jeff would say, a lorry. Ah, yes. <laughs> you can't get over that Jeffrey Taylor is here. Is it from Edgbaston? One hot summer day in 1930, walking along Hollywood Boulevard, you drop in the offices of the Actors' Equity Association, more to get out of the heat and rest your tired feet than anything else. And casually, you ask if there's anything uh, going on in the way of casting. And what did the man say? He said, uh, are you working? And I said, at the moment, no. And he sent me downtown for uh, to try out for parts in a play downtown. Do you recall the play? A play called The Criminal Code. I shall always remember it. You get the part at the Velasco, but what's more important, this leads to your playing the same role in the motion picture in of The, the film, Criminal yes. Code. Yeah. This is followed by a good part in Young Donovan's Kid with Richard Dix and Jackie Cooper. And then... Frankenstein, starring Boris Karloff. The part that made you immortal to moviegoers. It took us about four hours in the morning. <laughs> put the Frankenstein face and the head on, Boris. And nearly Jack. an hour to take it off. Yes. The whole outfit weighed about 20, 35 pounds. Yeah, you know who that is, Boris. One of the leading makeup Jack artists Pierce. in motion pictures who flew down here from Angel's Camp, California, where he's working on the Ransom Broidy production, Bullwhip, your very good friend, Jack Pierce. The best makeup man in the world. Ah, what Thank a, you. What a, I owe him a lot. Thank you. Boris, I have little remembrance for the monster <laughs> that you have portrayed. And I think this remember the days we worked day and night oh, to create it. Tell them what it is. Right on the day. That's the little uh, no. <laughs> That's the electric lot to d connect electricity. I used to call it the alamite. Alamite. <laughs> 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 well, and um, uh, Boris had to work in that heavy outfit all day, every day for, oh, how many weeks? Uh, Eighteen weeks. Eighteen weeks, that right. And but Boris, remember? When you came out to my place at Mancino, and we worked outside in the yeah, yard yeah, to make the yeah, makeup. Yeah. And then from there, we went to Malibu Beach. That's Three o'clock right. in the morning, I think. Three o'clock right. in the morning, yeah, that's, that's right. right. That's and then right. we made the makeup, and we went out to location, and after that, we he ca came back to the studio. And, and worked you, all that night. All that night, and carry uh, Colin Clive and you back, I with the bloodhounds chasing you. I remember it. What a stamina. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> 
It's wonderful to see you. Great to see you, Jack. Thank so you. Wonderful. The compassion, Boris, that you gave to the character of the monster is still considered one of the top acting achievements of the screen. Thank you, Jack Pierce. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Jack. And Boris can hold his head on now. He has to hold it. How many Frankenstein pictures did you actually make, Boris? Three, and three only. Yes. <laughs> but uh, we remembered you, too, in many other notable characterizations. In the old dark house, the ghoul, as Fu Manchu, Tower of London, and... That was Jack's work. Yes, Jack Pierce. Many, many others, too. <laughs> and then, in 1941, Boris, comes a chance for you to appear in a play on Broadway. What play? Arsenic and Old Lace, my first play in New York, and I was terrified. That's right, you'd never appeared on Broadway. You almost <coughs> talked yourself out of this one, but your two good friends, Howard Lindsay and Russell Krauss, producers of Arsenic and Old Lace, wanted very much to be with you here tonight, but the pressure of working on a new play made the trip west yeah. impossible this time. So, here they are, speaking to you from New York, Mr. Krauss and Mr. Lindsay. <laughs> oh, I'll see you. <laughs> Hello, Ralph. Yes, we had found this play Arsenic and Old Lace, a very funny and wonderful play by Joseph Kesselring. And there was a part in that play, it occurred to us, no one but Boris Karloff should play. That was an inspiration on our part. <laughs> I happened to be acting in Life of Father at the time, so Russell went out to California to talk to Boris. As I remember, you met him in lunch, didn't you? Yes, it was at Lucy's. Uh, you remember, don't you, Boris? I do, yeah. uh, You hadn't the slightest idea why I'd ask you to lunch, and finally you asked. And I told you that Howard and I wanted you to appear for us in a Broadway play. And you gave me the fastest and quickest no I've ever had in my life. You said, me, on Broadway? Not a chance. I've played in stock companies and road companies, but it would be very presumptuous of me to try to act on Broadway. So, in as much as I was stuck with the check anyway, we just sat and talked, and finally your curiosity got the better of you, and you said, what's the play about? And I told you, I told you that yours was the part uh, of a criminal who had been done over by a plastic surgeon and made to look like Boris Karloff. Uh, you must admit, Boris, that that was a pretty brilliant idea of casting. Uh, you have to credit Howard and me with that. No one but uh, us would have thought of ca uh, casting you in that part, Boris. That's and perfectly you true. And you looped at the bait, <laughs> because you said, I'll be making fun of myself. But you did lay down one condition, which was this, that it must not be the most important part in the play. Well, in the script, there were three or four other parts that looked more important. But in performance, Boris, I'm not so sure. What do you I, think, Buck? You're well, quite... I think it was a very important part, both for Boris and for us. But this first luncheon, you remember, led to another luncheon, a slightly more expensive luncheon. <laughs> yes, oh, that other yes. one meant for us. We had to pay your salary for four years. Yes. But there were four very happy and pleasant years for us. They we were indeed. Right with it too. For us, we know that this is your life, but, oh, it's a big part of our life, too. Thank you, Howard. Thank you very much, Howard Lindsay and Russell Krauss in New York. During the war, Boris, you play arsenic and old lace surrounded by a company of servicemen, and you hop from island to island, covering practically the whole South Pacific. Then you return to movies, to radio in Boris Karloff's treasure chest and award-winning children's program, to television in the Colonel Marks series, and to the theater in two great personal triumphs in the Broadway hits Peter Pan and The Lark. And then last spring... You were the first legitimate star ever to play with an amateur group in Alaska the Anchorage Community College Theater Workshop. Well, that can be only one man, Boris. Frank, Frank the director Frank, of the workshop Frank, at Anchorage, Alaska, Frank Brink. And here is Mr. Brink. <laughs> Jolly good to see you, Frank. What play did Boris do with your group there in Alaska, Frank? Well, of course, <laughs> Ralph, Arsenic and Old Lace. <laughs> That's really... And from the very beginning, Boris became part of the group. Not a star, mind you, Ralph, but, but just one of us. And when he found out that uh, we were trying to no, raise no. the funds, I'm going to tell it because <laughs> it needs to be told. When, when he discovered we were trying to raise the funds to build our own theater, he turned over every penny of his percentage of the profits to our building fund. <laughs> and Boris, I want you to know that the people of Anchorage have taken you into their hearts and 
they have designed a little golden trowel which uh, we want to give to you to let you know how grateful we'll always be for what you've done for us. And here is Thank you. the trowel right there. Thank you, Frank oh, Brink of Anchorage, Alaska. Thank you. We'll see you after since early childhood, you've had a great interest in sports, especially cricket, which is to English fans what Major League Baseball is to us. You know most of the great stars of the game. Yeah. Well, then, let's see if you know this one. Just by his voice. Now, you listen. Boris, you'd been on the waiting list for membership in the Surrey County Cricket Club for I don't know how many years. Jim Laker. Last year, your turn finally came up. Congratulations. He's probably the greatest bowler, like a pitcher in baseball, of all time. Last year, he set a new world's record by registering 19 wickets in one test match, uh, which is like a pitcher pitching two consecutive uh, shutouts on he two consecutive days for in a World Series. Here from London, England, is your friend Jim Laker. Oh, <laughs> oh my. <laughs> Oh, it must have been a pretty important day for Boris when he first uh, watched a match as a member of the Surrey Cricket Club, Jim, eh? Yes, it certainly was. You might say it was something like a, a regular Milwaukee fan getting a lifelong ticket to watch all the Braves. <laughs> it worked pretty well in two days. <laughs> yes, I stood on the balcony at Lord's with Boris and we looked over this great expanse, this wonderful cricket ground, and he turned around to me and he said, well... This is like dying and going to heaven. <laughs> <laughs> and Boris, because you've been so loyal to all the Surrey boys, they asked me if I bring a cricket ball over with me, suitably inscribed, and present it to you tonight on this occasion. Thank you, Jim Thank Laker. You, Jim. One of the all-time greats of cricket for coming here tonight from London, England. This evening, Boris, like your life, would not be complete without the wonderful gal who's always at your side, who guides and counsels you in your career, and who gladly puts up with her lot as a cricket widow in England, your lovely wife, Evie. And... <laughs> Oh, oh, what a time poor Evie's been going through. You may have risen to fame as a monster on the screen, Boris, but to all of us who know you, you're a man with a great heart, a living testimony to your love of your profession is that you were one of the 20 actors who founded the Screen Actors Guild in 1933. You hold gold membership card number nine. This is your life, Boris Karloff. <laughs> now as to your future, Boris Karloff, Ivory will of course uh, see to it that uh, you receive a film of tonight's program and this Bell and Howell sound projector to show it on, as well as this Bell and Howell uh, 16 millimeter movie camera. Then, too, Ivory has asked Marshall Jewelers of New York City to specially design this gold charm bracelet. Where is it? Here it is, somewhere. There's a gold charm bracelet for your wife, Evie, <laughs> uh, here. Each charm, uh, as you know, will represent an important step in your life when you get it. It'll be here, Evie. <laughs> if you get it. <laughs> For you, Boris, I'll tell you about this in just a moment. This is another sort of a thing here, and they're coming out together. As a remembrance uh, from This Is Your Life, we have this uh, gold wristwatch and money clip. Now, you see it has a gold replica of your membership card in the Screen Actors oh, Guild. God. And we know how impressed you are with the work being done by the young people of the College Theater uh, Workshop in Anchorage, Alaska, and how interested you are in their plans to erect their own theater. So in your name, Ivory is happy to send them a check for their building fund. Frank can take that on back. And finally, Boris, we understand that you have a birthday this coming Saturday. Isn't uh, there someone else whose birthday uh, falls on the same day as yours? I believe so, yes. Your daughter? Yes. Sarah Jane. Well, here she is from Sausalito, California, where she's attending a Munson Business School from San Francisco, your daughter, by a previous marriage, Sarah Jane. <laughs> Oh, yes, uh, whenever possible, you've always spent your birthdays together. Oh, sit right down here by Daddy, haven't you, Sarah Jane? Yes, but not this year because Dad and me will be on the way to New York. Sure, and well, that's why we want you to be here tonight, uh, Sarah Jane, so you and your dad could celebrate your birthdays right now. <laughs> we have a little birthday gift for you, Sarah Jane. Marcel Jewelers wants you to have this uh, four-leaf clover pendant in topaz, your birthstone. Evie, you get your charm bracelet, don't worry. <laughs> and you have many, many more happy birthdays together. This is your life, Boris Karloff. Good night and God bless you. This is your life. It's a Ralph Edwards production produced by Axel Gruenberg and directed by Richard Gottlieb.